for inviting me. Thanks for coming, everyone. So, yeah, I want to I want to talk about the wave function today. So, um, the you know the, the the basic problem is is the obvious and familiar one. Quantum mechanics is an incredibly successful theory, um, but we don't know how to interpret it in some sense that's obviously contested. Right. Uh, one way of stating this difficulty is this, that quantum mechanics is written in terms of the quantum state or wave function psi, um, but we don't know what psi represents. Um, so uh, an obvious terminological matter, in one sense, of course, we do know what psi represents. Right? Strictly speaking, the wave function functions a mathematical object. Right? Um, what it is is a function from space-time coordinates to complex numbers. We know precisely what it is, right? So that's not the, the interesting question, right? It's commonplace to also use the term the wave function to stand for whatever it is that this mathematical function represents. And that's how I'm going to use it today. And that's the question in the title is, is what is this thing, not what is the mathematical function? OK. So, um, what is the wave function? Well, there's a bewildering variety of answers out there in the literature. It's a field in a high dimensional space, says David Albert and Jill North. It's a dynamical law, says Shelley Goldstein and Fabio Lori. It's a kinematical constraint, Bubin Petowski. It's a set of possible worlds, says Al Wilson. It's a property, says Brad Monton and David Wallace. It's a relational structure, says Carlo Rovelli. It's an informational structure, says Jeff Boob. It's a prescriptive device, says Chris Fuchs and Richard Healy. Right. Um, so, so how do we decide between this, this bewildering variety of possible interpretations of the wave function? Well, one place to start is just to go back to the source, right? To go back to um, the original introduction of the wave function in um, Schrodinger's 1926 paper. Right? And um, Carlo Rovelli in 2018 wrote um, a very nice uh, gloss on this paper, uh, a, a summary of what Schrodinger achieved in this, in this 1926 paper. Right? Um, so what did Schrodinger do in his 1926 paper? With hindsight, he took a technical and a conceptual step. The technical step was to change the algebraic language of the theory, unfamiliar at the time, into a familiar one, differential equations. The conceptual step was to introduce the notion of wave function psi, soon to be evolved to, into the notion of quantum state psi, endowing it with heavy ontological weight. OK. Um, so the technical step. Um, is to change the formulation of quantum mechanics. In earlier um, formulations of quantum mechanics, for example, Born and Jordan in 25, they used uh, infinite matrices to derive predictions from the theory. Um, these tools were unfamiliar at the time. Right? Um, what Schrodinger did was to replace these infinite matrices with a differential equation. And physicists see the differential e equation, and they say, aha, I know what that is. That's a wave equation. I know precisely what to do with that. Right? Um, this is a much more familiar mathematical tool. And what's more, the solution to, a, to the differential equation for a single particle is a function of space and time. Right? And that um, is readily visualizable, as every student of physics knows. You can solve the Schrodinger equation for a potential well. And you get these nice functions that you can draw, right? Um, similarly, you can solve um, the Schrodinger equation for the single electron in a hydrogen atom and um, plot these lovely orbitals, right? Which are incredibly useful in, in chemistry, right? OK, so that's nice. Um, but Ravelli remarks of this con conceptual step, this conceptual step was wrong and dramatically misleading. We are still paying the price for the confusion it has generated. Schrodinger's basis for giving ontological weight to psi was the claim that the quantum theory is a theory of waves in physical space. But this is wrong. Already the quantum state of two particles cannot be expressed as a collection of functions on physical space. Most importantly, if we treat the wave as the real stuff, we fall immediately into the horrendous measurement problem. <clears throat> in its most vivid form due to Einstein, how can a wave spread over a large region of space suddenly concentrate on a single place where the quantum particle manifests itself? Okay, so um, Ravelli thinks that Schrodinger made a 
big mistake in giving ontological weight to the wave function um, for two reasons, right? what we might call the dimension problem and the measurement problem. Right? So the dimension problem um, is just the familiar one. If we've got the wave function of a, of a single particle, psi 1, which is localized in two regions A and B, and we've got a wave function of a second particle, psi 2, that's localized in the same two regions, then this could be the wave function of the pair in a six-dimensional space, right? So I'm just using one dimension for each particle, and the wave function amplitude here is coming out of the page, if you like, right? So the wave function amplitude is large here and here. Right? So here, notice that um, the positions of the two particles are correlated, right? If particle one's at A, then so is particle two. If particle one, two, one's at B, then so is particle two. That is nowhere encoded in the separate wave functions of the two particles. Right? Uh, to see this, um, you, can, you can switch to an anti-correlated wave function. Right? Now the two particles are in different locations, but the wave functions of, of the two particles individually are exactly the same. Right? Or if there's no correlation, then we get a, a wave function of the pair of particles that looks like this, but the individual wave functions of the two particles are exactly the same. So a two-particle system, Ravelli is pointing out, can only be fully represented by a six-dimensional wave function, except in the single particle case. The wave function of a system can't be visualized in physical three-dimensional space. You need a six-dimensional space for two particles, a nine-dimensional space for three, and so on. So that's the dimension problem. And then there's the measurement problem. Um, if the system is faithfully represented by this spread out wave, uh, why are particles always found at precise locations? If the, if the state of the pair of particles in six dimensional space is this spread out thing, um, when you look for the particles, you will fi always find them at some precise location. So here they're both found at A. Um, so Ravelli thinks that this, this should be enough to sync the wave function um, as um, an ontological thing, as a, as a representation of the way the world is. Um, here's the way he puts it. All these obvious difficulties which render the ontologicization of psi absurd were rapidly pointed out by Heisenberg. But Heisenberg lost the political battle against Schrodinger for a number of reasons. First, all this was about interpretation, and for many physicists, this was not so interesting after all, once the equations of quantum mechanics began producing wonders. Most importantly, Bohr, the recognized fatherly figure of the community, tried to mediate between his two brilliant bickering children by obscurely agitating hands about a shamanic wave-particle duality. Lovely turn of phrase. Um, to be fair, Schrodinger himself realized soon the problems with his early interpre interpretation and became one of the most insightful contributors to the long debate on the interpretation. But the misleading idea of taking the quantum state as a faithful description of reality stuck, right? So Ravelli thinks it's just a matter of historical contingency that, we're, that the wave function got this ontological weight. It shouldn't have happened. If Bohr hadn't confused everyone, it wouldn't have happened. Okay. But is it misleading and wrong? There's a, a long tradition in philosophy of thinking that uh, thinking that uh, thinking of the wave function ontologically is is neither misleading nor wrong. Right? Take um, David Albert for example. Once upon a time, the 20th century invest investigations of the behaviors of some subatomic particles were thought to have established that there can be no such thing as an objective, observer-independent, scientifically realized, empirically adequate picture of the physical world. And it was part and parcel of thinking things like that. It was, you might even say, the essence of thinking things like that, that one looked at quantum mechanical wave functions not as representing physical objects directly, but say as representing what observers know of such objects. And it has consequent, consequently been essential to the project of digging one's way out of these sort of confusions. It has been essential, that is, to the project of quantum mechanical realism to learn to think of wave functions as physical objects in and of themselves. So here's what I, <clears throat> the picture that Albert has in mind in his elementary quantum metaphysics. 
Albert thinks the wave function is a field and it's got to be defined over a three-n-dimensional three space where n is the number of particles in the universe. That's what there is. But the world looks to us as, as if it's three-dimensional. So here Albert bites the bullet. The apparent three-dimensionality three of the universe is an illusion, and he tells a story about how this illusion is brought about by the form of the dynamical laws. And to respond to Ravelli's accusation concerning the measurement problem, Albert would say, look, the measurement problem is a genuine problem. It's not an artifact of the formalism. We have various strategies for solving it. For example, Bohm's theory, spontaneous collapse theories, Everett, and so on. Okay. Um, how might you justify this move of taking the wave function as ontology? Well, Jill North in 2013 argues this way. Um, we adhere to a general principle to infer just that fundamental structure and ontology that is required by the dynamical laws. Only the entire wave, wave function defined over the entire high dimensional space contains all the information that factors into the future evolution of quantum mechanical systems. We are led to conclude that the fundamental space of a world governed by this dynamics is the high dimensional one. The fundamental ontology, which includes the wave function, then lives in it. So what, here's a principle. Um, what is there? Uh, whatever you need um, in order to formulate the dynamical laws. In quantum mechanics, what you need is a wave function defined over a high dimensional space. So that's what there is. Okay. Um, North doesn't go so far as to say that the three-dimensional world is an illusion. Um, so in, in place of Albert's anti-realism about three-dimensional space, she's, she suggests an anti-fundamentalism. Three-dimensional space is not fundamental, but it is real. OK. Um, but maybe we should pause for a while and think about whether North's principle is correct. Right, that we should accept um, the ontology that you, such that it allows you to formulate the dynamical laws of the theory. Arguing against that point of view, uh, Valia Lori in 2013 says, the mathematical formalism of a theory therefore has a history that constrains the interpretation of its formalism. The theory started with a metaphysical position and its appropriate mathematical representation. For this reason, the argument for the wave function ontology view is misguided. It assumes, in fact, that the mathematical formalism of a theory can be interpreted a posteriori, whereas it was fixed a priori by the physicist when she formulated the theory. Therefore, there's no rule to determine the primitive ontology of a theory. So here, Alori is arguing that you can't read the ontology off the mathematical form of a theory. And that seems plausible. I mean, just think about a simple harmonic oscillator. You can't tell what the ontology of the system you're describing is by looking at the mathematics of a simple harmonic oscillator. So why think you, should, you can do the same thing in quantum mechanics to read the ontology of the formalism of a the theory? Um, so it doesn't follow that a piece of math mathematics is used descriptively from the fact that it obeys a differential equation. Maybe such a conclusion follows if the differential equation is a genuine dynamical law, but that's really the question at issue. Is the, the Schrodinger equation a dynamical law or a complete dynamical law all by itself. Um, to resolve such issues, Alori suggests in this 2013 paper, we have to look at what the originator of the theory intended, which takes us right back to where we started. Um, so, so far, um, I've just been arguing for a couple of negative theses, right? that the mathematics by itself um, and the historical intentions of the originator of quantum mechanics don't fix the meaning of the wave function. You can't appeal to what Schrodinger did to fix the meaning of the wave function. You can't appeal to the bare mathematics in which the theory is expressed to fix the meaning of the wave function. So then what should we do? In a, a more recent paper, Alori suggests um, a form of functionalism. How should we figure out what the wave function is? Well, the wave function is as the wave function does. And in a, a similar vein, in a, in, a, in a recent book, Richard Healy argues for a pragmatist 
uh, interpretation of the wave function. According to a pragmatist understanding of quantum theory, sorry, according to a pragmatist, understanding quantum theory is a matter of knowing how it's applied and how the theory's various elements function in these applications. That is, the suggestion is that if we want to understand the wave function, we should attend not to the bare mathematics or the history of physics, but to the, the way that the wave function is used. Okay, so what does that approach yield? Alori thinks that um, if you look at the way the wave function is used, um, it's used in a nomological role. It's one of the ingredients necessary to write the dynamics for the ontology, which in turn constructively accounts for the measurement outcomes. If this is right, then the wave function isn't a thing, right? But instead, it's a dynamical constraint on how things move. Is it a law then? Well, not in the usual sense. Not in the usual sense of law, right? We, think of, we don't think of laws as contingent and time dependent. We don't think of laws as varying over time and being subject to initial conditions. But the wave function is time varying and subject to initial conditions. Um, so it's not a law by itself in the traditional sense, um, but it looks kind of law-like. It looks like an ingredient in a law. Right? Um, maybe something like a law in a context. In any case, the fact that it occupies a high dimensional space is irrelevant to the ontology of things. Right? Um, the wave function occupies a high dimensional space, but the wave function isn't part of the ontology of things. Right? It's an objective thing. Laws are objective. It's a law-like thing but it's, it's, it's not part of the fundamental ontology of the, of the world, not part of the furniture of the world. Okay, but then what are the things that are governed by the wave function? If the wave function itself is not the thing, what are the things? Um, here, Alori gives us what she calls a quantum theory construction kit. So we've got some choices to make. Um, what could the things be that are governed by the wave function? They could be particles in three-dimensional space. They could be a matter density field in three-dimensional space. They could be point-like events, so-called flashes in four-dimensional space-time. Then once you've picked an, um, an ontology, then you've got two elements of the theory to fix, right? You need an evolution equation for the wave function, and in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, that's just the Schrodinger equation. And you need an evolution equation for the ontology given the wave function. That's going to be something new, something additional. Um, what are the results? Well, a bewildering variety of results. There's Bohm's theory. Um, there's various versions of spontaneous collapse theory with a particle ontology, a matter field ontology, or flashes as an ontology. Um, there are particle, matter field, and flash-based many worlds theories, argues Alori. So as Alori sees it, the, dis the dispute then is about which of these theories is best. And that's going to have to be settled based on something other than empirical adequacy. They're all constructed to be empirically adequate. Um, so now I have some sympathy with this approach. It's, it's, it's basically the approach on which I've spent, you know, the majority of my career is spinning out various consequences of these different ontological pictures, right? Um, but I also have some, some lingering background worries about the whole approach. So here's, here's some worries, right? Um, well, we're going to have to decide between these theories on the base of some, basis of something other than empirical adequacy, some non-empirical theory choice criteria. Can we agree on what these criteria are? You know, simplicity? Well, simplicity is always a contested criterion. Is there something else? So much new physics, right? For each of these ontologies, we've got to come up with a new dynamical law. The dynamical law for um, laws have been formulated for a number of these, you know, that everyone knows the, the dynamical law according to which the Bohmian particles move, right? Similarly for the various spontaneous collapse dynamics that 
were developed by Girardi and, and his students. Um, but that's a whole bunch of new physics. Right? And new physics brings with it new problems. And what if all the options are no good? Right? Um, what if they all violate relativity, say? Um, so there's, there's a lot of work involved in this conception, and it's not clear that the work's going to pay off. Um, is there any way forward that doesn't require us to do this work, to reinvent physics from the ground up? Maybe a more thoroughgoing functionalism or pragmatism can make this underdetermination go away. I mean, what we've got here is underdetermination on a grand scale, right? Um, we've got a whole bunch of possible theories that yield the same predictions. Can we make this underdetermination go away? Um, by being maybe a little more thoroughgoing in our functionalism or pragmatism. Um, this is what Healy suggests in his recent book. Um, his suggestion is that there is no quantum ontology. There is no ontology of the quantum world. And looking for an ontology of the quantum world is just misguided. Right? Um, so here's the way he says it. Quantum theory has no physical ontology and states no facts about physical objects or events. What does he mean? Well, here's a, a very brief outline of his project. Right? Um, according to Healy, the wave function is used prescriptively rather than de descriptively. Right? It doesn't describe the world. It prescribes what your degrees of belief should be. Degrees of belief in what? Well, non-quantum claims. Right? What are non-quantum claims? They're claims that describe classical objects like particles and fields. Right? At the end of the day, um, what is it that you're ascribing a probability to using the Born rule? It's some claim about a particle or a claim about a field. But particles and fields are not themselves specially quantum mechanical objects. They're, they're, they're part of the ontology of classical physics. That is what, what Healy suggests is you can apply quantum mechanics to a variety of pre-existing physical ontologies, but quantum mechanics itself doesn't supply the ontology. Right? Here's, here's my ontology, now apply quantum mechanics to that. Right? So you can choose an ontology of particles, an ontology of classical fields, um, whatever you like. Okay, so what's the difference between Healy's approach and Elori's approach here? Right? Um, Essentially, I think they're more or less on the same page. Interpreting the wave function as nomological and as prescriptive are essentially the same thing, right? A law tells you what to expect, right? So um, interpreting the wave function of, as nomological is interpreting it as prescriptive, as telling you what to expect. Um, the difference is that Allori proposes explicit model building for the underlying ontology, Whereas Healy proposes piggybacking on existing classical models. Don't build new physics, make do with the old one. In fact, it's classical physics. That's the ontology to which we apply quantum mechanics. Um, but in either case, um, whether we're explicitly building a model for the underlying ontology or piggybacking on existing classical models, um, the elephant in the room, it seems to me at least, um, is the no-go theorems, for example, Bell's theorems. Why? Well, these suggest that an account of quantum mechanics in terms of the properties of some underlying ontology is impossible, or at least highly problematic. Right? So if we're suggesting that um, quantum mechanics, the wave function is nomological and describes an underlying reality, that looks very close to saying there's hidden variables, see, and they behave this way. Right? Um, but taking quantum mechanics as an account of hidden variables is problematic because of Bell's theory. OK, so an aside on representation here, uh, I'm going to talk about Bell's theorem for a little bit. And so I'm going to talk about it in terms of spin, because that's the easiest way to talk about Bell's theorem. right? And, and spin states are most readily represented using a vector in Hilbert space rather than a wave function in configuration space. Right? But um, don't read too much into that. These are these two ways of expressing the quantum state of mathematically equivalent. And if we're not trying to take the wave function representation as literally descriptive, there's no reason to prefer it. And we're, you know, we've moved away from taking it as literally descriptive. So we can we can use vectors in Hilbert space too if we'd like. They can 
perform the same nomological or prescriptive function. So um, we can express the state of a pair of spin half particles like this, right? Here's a, a standard uh, entangled state of a pair of spin half particles, right? And we won't worry about how to visualize such a state. Okay. So um, here's the familiar Bell's theorem set up. You input a pair of particles in the um, singlet state. And we've got a couple of, the particles are emitted by this source. One goes this way, one goes this way. They reach a couple of measuring devices. Each of these measuring devices has three settings, A, B, and C, which measure the, the spin in three different directions. Right? Um, and then for each measurement, either you get the result up or you get the result down. Okay, um, here's the output of this Bell device, the output predicted by quantum mechanics and observed by experimentalists. If the settings are the same, the results never agree. If the settings are different, the results agree three quarters of the time. Right? Um, then Bell makes some assumptions, the locality assumption that a measurement on one particle can't affect the state of the other because they're space-like separated. A uniqueness assumption that each measurement have, has exactly one outcome. And an independence assumption that the state of each particle is the independent of the measurements to be performed on it. Then if you make those assumptions, then Bell proves that no model satisfying these assumptions can reproduce the predictions of quantum mechanics. Right? Okay, so there's the familiar theorem. Right? But of course, there are loopholes Every theorem relies on assumptions, and the, the assumptions bring with, with them um, potential loopholes. Um, and Allori's construction kit models um, violate one or more of the assumptions of Bell's theorem. Right? For example, Bohm's theory violates the locality assumption. GRW type spontaneous collapse theories um, violate the locality assumption. Some of them violate the uniqueness assumptions. Uh, so assumption. Many world's theories, uh, Everettian theories, don't assume that each measurement has exactly one outcome, so they violate the uniqueness assumption. Uh, so, so Allori's proposal is, well, we can get around Bell's theorem um, by violating some of the assumptions. Right? Um, Healy takes a slightly different approach. Right? Healy says, well, specific property descriptions um, to the ontology are unwarranted prior to measurement, right? We should we should just shouldn't ascribe properties to um, if we if the ontology is particles, say we shouldn't ascribe part properties to the particles prior to the measurement. Right? Uh, now, that might be intention with Healy's claim that um, I think it is intention, but I'm not going to argue for that in detail here. With he Healy's claim that he's presupposing a classical underlying ontology, right? In, in um, withholding proper, property descriptions from, from particles um, until they're measured in a certain sense, until they undergo decoherence, um, then it's, it seems that um, Healy isn't exactly presupposing a classical underlying ontology. He's not presupposing an ontology of particles that always have positions, say. It's an ontology of particles that you know, sometimes have positions and sometimes don't. Um, so the, the problems with each of these approaches, with, with Allori's approach, uh, are well known, right? Violating locality um, is in tension with special relativity. Violating uniqueness is maybe not so problematic. We can talk about that. Um, Healy's approach, uh, I suspect that um, withholding property descriptions is in tension with, with his claim that the, class, the underlying ontology is entirely classical. Um, and maybe um, Healy would not want to um, commit himself to a, a stronger form of realism as I'm sort of implicitly committed to here. Um, but I'm interested in a, in a third way of um, getting around Bell's theorem. Right? And that is, uh, instead of violating the locality assumption or the uniqueness assumption, what about the independence assumption? And this has been explored somewhat. Um, so here's a, a proposal by um, Evans and others in 2013. Right? Take Bell's apparatus. Right? 
um, and rotate it in 90 degrees in the space-time coordinate system. Okay. Um, so instead of having these two measuring devices space-like separated, they're now time-like separated. Okay. So th this is now a single particle system. The particle starts here, it goes up to S and goes back here to R. Right? So S now is something like a mirror. It changes the direction of the particle and flips its spin. L is more like a preparation device than a measuring device. R is still a is still a measuring device. We can still use this state if we like, right, to represent the system in a prescriptive or a nomological sense. Right? Now the subscript one refers to the earlier state of the particle, and the subscript two re represents the later temporal stage of the particle. Right? Um, and this state tells us what to expect at R, given the setting at L, and vice versa, what the setting at L must have been given the output at R. Right? So we can use this state in a prescriptive sense right, to, to tell us about correlations between L and R. Um, but of course, in this case, the particle properties clearly depend on, this, on the setting at L. The setting at L is preparing the particles in a particular state. That is, in this rotated version, independence is violated and Bell's conclusion is avoided. Right? There's no, there's no, there's no Bell's theorem for for, for time-like separated me um, measurement and preparation systems, only for space-like. Right? Um, why? Because independence is obviously violated in this rotated apparatus. The interaction at L influences the statistical distribution of particle properties, and these properties are sufficient to explain the results we observe. There's no no-go theorem in play here. So why not do the same, Evans suggests, in the original setup? Right? That is, um, the particle properties depend on the setting at L. And by symmetry, the particle properties depend on the setting at R. Right? That, that's just a way of saying, um, why not violate the independence assumption? The statistical distribution of particle properties here depend on the setting at L. And the, the statistical distribution of particle properties here depend on the setting at R. Right? And then the quantum state tells us what to expect at R given the setting at L and vice versa. That's the job of the quantum state to tell us what to expect here given what you've done here and vice versa. Um, so then this way of thinking about the quantum state is thinking about it as something like a retrocausal or an atemporal global constraint on particle properties. Right? Um, price in 19, 1996 um, stresses the kind of retrocausal gloss on what's going on here. Silberstein and co. in 2018 stress the atemporal global constraint view. Right? But the, the idea is the same, that the interactions at L and R influence the statistical distribution of particle properties. You have to look at the whole thing to figure out the statistical distribution of particle properties. And these properties, the properties that the particle has here and here, the statistical distribution of those particle properties are sufficient to explain the results we observe. Okay, putting it all together. Um, so here's the kind of picture that I've been um, suggesting here. Think of the wave function as nomological or prescriptive. Um, what, if it's nomological or prescriptive, right, what is it telling us about? What is the ontology that this um, law-like thing is governing? Here I'm suggesting let's go along with Healy. Quantum mechanics su supplies no ontology of its own. The ontology is supplied by the target system. Right? So if you're applying quantum mechanics to a system of particles, then the ontology is particles. If you're applying quantum mechanics to a classical field, then the system then the ontology is a classical field. Um, but against Healy, I'm suggesting the proper, property ascriptions to this ontology 
are appropriate at all times, right? That's what it is essentially to assume a classical ontology, is to assume that there are particles and those particles have properties. Um, but then we have, to, we have to say something about the no-go theorems. Right? And the direction I'm suggesting is that we can avoid the no-go theorems by violating independence. That is, the quantum state functions as a global a temporal constraint on the statistical distribution of properties to the underlying ontology. How are the statistical, how are the properties statistically distributed to these particles? Well, the quantum state is a, is a, is a global constraint on, on those property descriptions. Right? Um, for the whole, whole of the system understood as extended in time as well as in space, the whole 4D system. Okay. But you might think, you know, you just dodged the central question here. You, was, you were going to tell us what the wave function is, and now you, you're going to tell us something about ontology, and now you're just saying, well, we don't have to answer the question about ontology. Um, let me try and defend that claim, right, that um, we don't have to answer the question about what the real underlying ontology is. Right? Maybe that question, what is the real underlying ontology, is an illegitimate question. Um, why? Well, in almost any field, different models can be appropriate in different circumstances, right? Um, Non-relativistic quantum mechanics is often applied to systems of particles, right? And this model of the underlying ontology is successful in a wide variety of cases. Right? Um, so think again about um, the um, application of a, the simple harmonic oscillator. The mathematics of a simple harmonic oscillator is applied to a wide variety of physical systems. Right? Similarly, you can apply non-relativistic quantum mechanics to a wide variety of physical systems. Um, you can apply it to a system of particles, say, and, and that model is um, successful in a wide variety of cases. Right? Um, but are we getting at fundamental ontology here? I see no reason to think so. Right? Um, we can think of the world as made up of particles, particles who behave according to non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And that, that model is widely applicable and widely successful. Um, but that's just um, instrumental success. Right? If the question is about the ontology at, at the fundamental level, if there is one, that's going to be about a question about the final form of subquantum physics, right? That's not a question that quantum mechanics should be expected to answer. Quantum mechanics is a kind of mid-level theory in, in physics, right? Um, it's not, non-relativistic quantum mechanics is not a fundamental theory, right? it's certainly not the fundamental theory. So we shouldn't expect to learn anything about fundamental ontology from quantum mechanics. We can apply it to particles if we like. Um, we can apply it to fields if we like. Um, but we shouldn't be looking at non-relativistic quantum mechanics to tell us about the real underlying ontology. OK. Um, let me finish up by um, presenting what I take to be the main challenge to the picture that I presented you with. And that's the challenge of interference. Um, so here's fam familiar two-slit interference for particles. Right? Um, two-slit interference for particles involves the application of quantum mechanics to a one-particle system. Right? We, one particle goes through this device at a time. Each particle interferes with itself. So applying quantum mechanics to this system is essentially applying quantum mechanics to a single particle. It's a nice, simple case. We can do that in three-dimensional space. Um, how can the ascription of properties to a particle, the challenge goes, explain the interference pattern? Right? What I've said so far is um, the ontology is whatever we apply quantum mechanics to. In this case, it's a single particle. Um, that's the ontology. We're applying, we're applying properties to a single particle. But how can an application of properties to a single particle explain this interference pattern, right? Sure, each, on each run of the experiment, we get a dot on the screen. We get a single particle. Right? 
But the mystery is why do these dots build up to form an interference pattern? How do we get away without talking about um, the wave function as a, as a real wave in space? Okay. Um, of course, if you're a Bohmian, you know, a Bohmian and a wave function realist, then you've got a ready answer, right? Well, here's why, because this particle gets pushed around by the wave stuff, right? And the possible traje particle traje trajectories become wiggly because the wave stuff pushes the particles around so that the, the particles are more likely to be here and here than here and here. Right? So if you're a, a Bohmian and a wave function realist, you've got a ready response. Um, the picture that I'm suggesting does not have such a ready response. Right? How's it going to go in outline? Well, the wave function determines the chance that the particles detected at D, given that it was emitted at S. Um, that is, the wave function constrains the frequencies of the various pos possible trajectories from S. And that constraints global, right? If, if you close one slit, then the set of trajectories would be different and the frequency distribution would be different. Right? So that's an outline of an explanation of interference. Right? Um, but it's likely to be unsatisfying. Right? It, the, the immediate response that's going to come to mind is, yeah, but why the interference pattern? Why do the frequencies differ in exactly this way rather than some other way? Right? Um, one kind of response is they just do. Right? Um, that's what the Schrodinger equation says, and the Schrodinger equation is law-like. Um, I think that's OK to say they just do. But maybe there's something more that can be said. Right? Um, and here's something that I'm not quite sure what to do with, but is kind of striking. If you look at any elementary textbook and look at um, the derivation of the Schrodinger equation, right? It's somewhere in an early chapter, they'll derive the Schrodinger equation. Right? Some point in that der derivation, there'll be a sentence like this. Um, Assume that particles massive particles have a wavelength given by Blair. Right. So the wavelength of particles is inserted in this derivation of the Schrodinger equation by hand. Right. Um, so it, it, it should come as no surprise, I suppose, that what pops out of the, wave, the Schrodinger equation at the end of the day is um, wave behavior. Right. Um, if there's an underlying explanation of periodic phenomena in quantum mechanics, I think, um, my guess is it, it lies at the subquantum level, right? Here we, we've, we've inserted this wavelength into the derivation of the Schrodinger equation, right? So of course, the periodicity comes out in the solutions to the, to the Schrodinger equation. But why is quantum mechanics periodic, right? That seems strikes me as a separate question from the question of, um, why are things quantized, right? Um, and I don't know of a good answer to the question of why quantum mechanics is periodic in this fundamental sense. Right? Um, so this is just to say, um, yeah, I have no good answer to why the interference pattern, right? Um, but maybe it's a, a more difficult question than people take it to be. Okay, um, so what have I argued today? Um, first thing I've argued is that the history of quantum mechanics is not a good guide to its ontology, and neither is the mathematical form of quantum mechanics. Right? Um, so I've been ag agreeing with Alori and Healy that we should look to the way quantum mechanics is used. Right? And I agree with them that this suggests that the wave function is something like nomological or prescriptive, although what that amounts to is, of course, a, a tricky question. Right? And I'm agreeing with, with Healy, for present purposes, that quantum mechanics doesn't supply any ontology of its own, um, but rather it's applied to a system with an ontology taken as given. But um, Healy thinks that the no-go problem, no-go, no-go theorems are unproblematic for his view. Right? I take them to be more problematic. I don't think he can just duck um, ascribing prop 
properties to the fundamental ontology as it suits him. Um, so given that, I feel that a, a, a more substantive response to the no-go theorems is appropriate. And what I've suggested here is that we can treat the wave function as a global atemporal constraint on property descriptions and that that provides a promising way forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, okay. I see people applauding, but not raising up. Yeah, I see two hands. So first I have Aurelien, uh, then I have Lev, and then Valia. Uh, Aurelien, you can go first. Oh, okay, sorry. So, uh, okay, so I put the, the microphone on. So uh, thank you very much for, for this uh, very uh, interesting uh, talk. Uh, and my questions or my remarks are about the, um, this uh, discussion that we give about this uh, nomological uh, approach, uh, which is indeed, uh, which was already discussed uh, the previous talk by uh, Radia Alori. Uh, and uh, it's a very, very uh, nice uh, description of uh, that is very often used, advocated by Bohmian, uh, by Bohmian physicists. And uh, so this, this uh, I think it's uh, it's very common to use it, but uh, um, it, uh, it, it, uh, it shows some uh, some limitation as you saw at the end of your talk uh, uh, you, when you present this challenge. Um, and in fact, uh, when you say also at the end of your talk that uh, the quantum mechanic is not a good, uh, uh, the history of quantum mechanic is not a good guide uh, to its ontology, I think you should start probably with uh, with, 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 with De Bruyne, not with Schrodinger. Because for Louis de Broglie, the situation was completely different. And I believe that uh, if you consider this, uh, as a, this guy as a starting point, then you have a different perspective. Because uh, uh, maybe Schrodinger was thinking about the wave uh, like a matter wave, but uh, uh, de Broglie uh, has a deeper way to think about it. And especially when you say that Bohmian mechanic is the normal standard way of thinking about Bohmian mechanic is nomological. Uh, this is not true for, for De Bruyne, for Bohm. And uh, I have an issue with this because, uh, uh, and, it, and this is connected to your challenge. You, see, you, you say that, um, they, imagine, you, you say in quantum mechanics, we have this wave which is guiding the trajectory. Okay, that's, that, this is Bohmian mechanic. Mm -hmm. But you have also the same thing in, uh, in classical physics. We have this Hamilton Jacobi equation, which is guiding the, tra the, the, the particles. And uh, so it, when you watch Bohmian mechanic in details, you see that it's looking very similar to, uh, to, to this uh, framework of hamilton jacobi equation, but you have a quantum potential, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I asked this question uh, recently to, 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 to Valia Lowry, so I'm asking you the, the same thing. Uh, you see in, uh, in Bohmian mechanic, the quantum potential cannot be, uh, it's not, it's not a classical force like a gravitation force or electromagnetic force. It's depending on the wave function. And uh, this is very interesting because uh, you can not remove this uh, dependence. Uh, even though, for example, you go to the Newtonian formalism, so you, you say you can describe force equation with the acceleration giving a, uh, is proportional to a applied force. You see that the force is containing these quantum elements, which is related to the quantum potential to the wave function itself. So uh, if you say that the, the, wave fun the, the, wave, the world of the wave function is only nomological, I would say it's only effective, that is maybe only temporary, temporary expedient, because uh, in a fundamental force, uh, you would have, for, like in a gravitation force of Newton, for example, you, it will only depend on the position of the particles. But here, you need to solve first the, the Schrodinger equation to have this, uh, this uh, potential. And then to, in, to insert it into the, into the dynamic to compute the trajectories. And uh, this is completely different. It means that uh, the, the wave is not only passive. It is a, it is a part of the, of the dynamic, which has to be, uh, which is probably a, a more fundamental, uh, maybe origin than simply a neurological uh, structure. So uh, I would say personally that is multi, the, the last remark at the end of your talk about the challenge of in, 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 uh, in, 
and, and interpreting the, 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 the difference is to go beyond beyond, beyond this nomological uh, structure and to, to find this, as you say, the subquantum level, which was also advocated by Bohm. So the, this is really, uh, yes, this is my, yes, that's my argument. So. Okay, good. So, so let me see if I can, I can, there, there are a number of things going on in your yeah, comments yeah, here. Yeah. I want to see if I can yeah, well, yeah. separate them and, and get them straight, right? So the first thing you said, um, if, if, I, if I want to understand the history of thinking about the wave function, the place to start is De Bruyne and not Schrodinger. And that, that may be, I mean, that, um, that De Bruyne thought about the, the wave function. I mean, did, did, did De Bruyne put it in terms of a wave function? De Bruyne function? think first about phase, and then after he had uh, the idea of having two waves. So a wave for guiding the particle, like a boom after him, but uh, also the wave as a physical interpretation in three-dimensional space, like uh, like in gravitation, it would be a, mm. the, the, the field of gravitation would be a nonlinear equation, and then for him it was the same. So we have two different perspectives of on, on, uh, concerning the waves for, for the Broglie. So uh, I think they have different level of uh, of uh, interpreting the the wave function for for for, for him. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, as far as Bohmian. Uh, your point about Bohmian mechanics, I, I, I take that point. I think it, it's, I, I think you're probably right that it's, ver it's very, it's very difficult to understand Bohmian mechanics as just um, a theory of particles. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, there have been a number of people trying to make, make that case uh, by a, appealing to various forms of, of superhumanism and, and, and things like that. Uh, but but I, I take, I think you're right that it's very difficult to un understand Bohm's theory as a theory of particles. So that the, 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 the wave function does seem to be playing some, some dynamical role in the theory. Um, and, and it sort of has to, um, given the constraints imposed by, um, by the no-go theorems, um, just you know, get, getting getting quantum mechanics out of just describing properties to separated particles isn't gonna isn't gonna give you the the bell in it. It's something that violates the bell in it quality, right? So I think I think that's got to be right. Um, so so what I'm su what I'm suggesting is, if we really want to um, understand. The way that quantum mechanics could be a theory of particles that you you could just say well in this case i'm just going to say the ontology is particles right you're going to have to do something very different from Bo from bohmian mechanics i mean i think that's that's the bottom line you're going to have to my my suggestion is that that um one way to go might be to to violate independence rather than yeah, locality and, and, and then <laughs> then you then you might be able to actually get a, get away with a particle only theory but I, I agree with you that that interpreting bohmian mechanics as a particle only theory is a very mm -hmm. tricky indeed yeah thank you uh Lev? um thank you peter for a very clear lecture and uh in fact uh, you were telling something i was very upset but then you said Okay, but maybe it's not so. And this was <laughs> good. Uh, but uh, I'm still uh, kind of uh, in some, I would say, I would set and disagree. Um, I, you uh, were telling that there are difficulties with wave function, considering it as ontology. And, uh, but then you said, but uh, you're very, you're Wave function is not ontology. What are, what is the ontology? What are the things? And uh, you had some list of all these theories. You said that you work on it long time, and you are not too happy. Which uh, I, I I'm very sympathetic with your view. I think uh, there are very good reasons not not to be uh, happy with uh, GRW, Bohm, uh, and uh, all these kind of things. Now, in fact, you mentioned uh, the one of the things which uh, this many words, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, you was kind of, uh, you said that maybe it's good, but uh, I think you said that you will talk about it later or maybe misunderstood you. You, you, ne- you, you never talk about it later. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, and uh, the problem when you, uh, then you, I think you, you know, said about the uh, value approach that maybe the wave function is something which will help us with these other things uh, to deal with. And then you mentioned this. Boom, GRW, and you meant many words models. I am very much upset about models. There's no model. Many words is just interpretation which tells that the wave function is the ontology, it's the only ontology. And there is no model. Many words are just uh, words which we discuss how we explain how this ontology uh, leads to our experience. So for me, uh, the main message, I'm very, I think the only ontology is a wave function. Uh, one of my papers, Psi is all. There's nothing but the Psi. Now, three dimension is also part of the story. It's postulated, it's given. And uh, you can find uh, how, we, how we connect ourselves in three dimension with this they function that uh, live in three n dimension uh, formally, but it has many uh, really in every word things are in three dimension. The wave function really just three dimension. Now, uh, then you continue it with this wave function giving its very small role. I think the, the, the question is what is our theory? It's not just what the wave function is part of the quantum mechanics. You, uh, you mentioned that maybe wave function should not be the ontology because maybe it's field theory, string theory. I understand what you had in mind. This is not the basic thing. I, I don't think that there is a reason to believe that this going to field theory and up will change something dramatic. For us, quantum mechanics explain essentially 99% of what we experience. So I don't think these other things we will change. So it's supposed to, uh, quantum mechanics supposed to tell us uh, what it is. The, your final thing is that quantum meca- wave function is give us some constraint. I want theory. As a physicist, I want physical theory. Constraint is not good enough. What is, um, w- w- what is our theory? And all this theory is uh, all this, and I, I don't think you mentioned everyone who mentioned these strange ideas of uh, giving up statistical independence. But in another language, it means that when I come with my measuring device, my measuring device is kind of correlated or connected to my uh, physical system. Then all physics breaks down. Physics do not work like this. The, the basic idea of physics, that your measuring device is independent of your system. If it is not independent, you cannot do anything. It's, a, it's no physics, no science. So this sounds for me completely out of, it's not. And um, of course, if there is a failure and you cannot get a kind of normal science, like people's, I have experience and I don't want that my experience is ontology. I want that something's there, it will explain it. And the wave function explained it perfectly. I have to accept many words. Without many words, I have bell and other things, strange things. But in the moment you accept that there are parallel experiences, wave function ontology, at least I see no problem whatsoever. Okay, good. So, um, there were two main criticisms as i see it in what you just said one main criticism huge gap in my paper because i you know i didn't give a fair shake to many worlds and that's that's fair i did not um and second criticism is um that once you give up independence then the possibility of doing science goes away with it um so so let me let me address them in turn you're right that I, I didn't really give um, uh, a, a concerted 
critique of the many worlds approach here and you know in in part that's because i don't have a knockdown argument against many worlds right maybe i should just say at some point here's one way you could go you know i really don't like it i don't like the, this parallel reality stuff just just makes me uncomfortable that is not an argument right um if there's an argument it's going to have to do with probability as 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 you you know as you well know is and and the you and others have have good arguments that we can find probabilities in many worlds quantum mechanics um i'm still not a hundred percent convinced that those arguments work but they they might work and you know that's that seems to be the the main stumbling block and then there's um the question of of finding three-dimensional reality in this high dimensional object and you said you know that there there are ways you can appeal to decoherence theory to, to... No, no 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 decoherence so this is not no decoherence totally different from david wallace's way of finding no, no decoherence you don't need decoherence microscopic object immediately give you decoherence there is no meaning you don't need any environment so the microscopic ob objects will not interfere so the, the word, it's complete, it's complete uh, myth that the coherence made many words on a solid ground. You don't, it's obvious the, the, the decoherence part is completely obvious. It's not needed. Okay. Um, so in that case, there, there are several stories about how you get three dimensionality out of, out of many worlds. There's, um, David Wallace tells a decoherent story. You tell a story, as I understand it, where the, the three-dimensionality is sort of in there from the beginning. It's part of the structure of the of the wave function. Is that would that be a fair way of, of spinning your position? Physics built. We have three dimension. Everything is three dimension. Like every uh, Albert also see, say three n three is three. So we yeah. have this, and then. When you decompose the universal wave function to the wave function corresponding to worlds in which creatures like us exist, microscopic objects exist, and all have very well-defined position. Then the center of mass or position, whatever, what characterizes this microscopic object live in three dimension. In this way, uh, a, a cat can uh, catch a mouse because they all live in three dimension. So if you look on the center of mass of a cat and center of mass of a mouse, it's a it's three-dimensional wave function. Mm -hmm. So of course there is kind of entanglement for uh, we need it for uh, uh, stability of matter. That, uh, so there's a lot of entangled things. But uh, when I catch something, uh, it's all in three dimensions. So I I have explanation of everything around in three dimensions, uh -huh. and it's okay. very much. Uh, like I think collapsed wave function live in three dimension. Right. So this is, uh, and so I have the three dimensional wave function. Just use the uh, Van Neumann collapsed wave function or textbook wave function. I just say that I don't need to kill others. I, I would like to, but it's very, uh, it's very ugly to kill others. I don't have a good physical theory. GRW are not so, uh, well, Philip Pearl, uh, they don't have nice, uh, in a theory without action at a distance without randomness so i don't mm -hmm. so i don't need it but otherwise just take uh, take every physicist and he works very well this collapsed wave function in three dimension he doesn't have this problem good yeah so so um in terms of the dimensionality you know Al albert makes a big deal of saying well, if the wave function is all there is, then the world has this high dimensionality and any three dimensionality oh, yeah. is an illusion, right? And your response is, um, I take it, well, the wave function is three n dimensional, but equally it's three dimensional. I mean, it's the, the, like a two perspective view, maybe you can view it as a multiple three dimensional worlds, or you can view it as a, three-dimensional whole? 
in this uh, first you take the universal wave function which is very entangled and very much mm -hmm. and most of it you need three and dimension then you say what it's important for me it's my wave function so mm -hmm. when i'm what the world wave function still i have some entanglement and mm -hmm. then i need uh, kind of um, many dimensionality but i find there the important thing for my action which are really three dimensional aspects so I decompose this wave function to variables, which some of them in three dimension and some of them in three K dimension of my. Uh -huh. So we can recover the three dimensional appearances. Yes. Something like that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. I have no great objection to that project. Um, so the, the other, um, the, the, the other, objection to to the end of my talk that you was you were suggesting if we if we violate independence then um science is not possible well um it i think it's going to depend on how independence is violated um so you know Measuring devices affect measure, measured systems all the time. You stick a thermometer in a glass of water. You don't you, you don't get the temperature of the water before you put the thermometer in it. Right? The, the measuring device affects the temperature of the measured system. Right? Is that a problem? Nah, not really. You know, to the to the you know, if you were if you were after that much precision for the temperature of the water, you shouldn't have used a great big old fashioned thermometer. Right? Um, so a couple of things about the violation of independence in the quantum case you said first thing you said is this isn't a theory you haven't given me a theory that's right i have not given you a theory i've given you a speculative direction for a theory and, and th this has been sort of a speculative direction since 1996 when hugh price first said things in this in this vein right so so that's right. That's a big worry. You know, if, if there's a theory here to be had, why has no one formulated it? Right. So I, I take that as a as a serious worry. But but one, once we um, once we have that theory, then we can look at the violations of independence that it contains and see if they're really a threat to doing science. And my my sense is that if they're going to give us um, quantum mechanics as empirically adequate then 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 no there's i mean it's 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 it it's a constraint on constructing such a theory that it's not going to interfere with the the doing of science this is this is purely a way of understanding what we're doing it seems since we have very successful theory which works when we have a paradox then <laughs> we can break our rules but today there are no paradox it's not the situation of 120 years ago. Everything which physicists can calculate and measure agree. They say there is some dark matter that exists, but it's really not, uh, they cannot calculate it exactly and they cannot measure it exactly. Everything they can exactly calculate and measure agree. They, uh, so there is no any reason to make any kind of dramatic changes in uh, philosophy in uh, science because today science works that's right and when when you say let's try to look for something which doesn't exist what just to save you from uh, not having your copy in parallel world i don't think this is a good enough reason to to say that we don't understand nature i want to believe that i understand nature i have to admit i have copies okay um that's right we have a theory that works great right um so i mean but as an advocate of many worlds you are not um satisfied with we have a theory that works great so we don't have to come up with an interpretation of that theory right you you, you say that the, the interpretation is an important part of doing physics and that requires me to accept that I have copies, right? Um, yeah, that's right. We we so we end up with a surprising consequence from this interpretive project, right? So 
yeah, you can't get away without surprising con consequences, yeah. right? So, so what I'm suggesting is an alternative. And um, maybe, I mean, there's a lot of work to do to show that it's a good competitor to many worlds, which has been developed for a long time now, right? But, but you know, any interpretive project is, is going to require saying surprising things about the world for quantum mechanics, I think. I mean, if you want, if you want to avoid saying surprising things about the world, then you just have to be an instrumentalist and, and you know, rest content with shut up and calculate. But yeah, yeah, violations of independence will be truly surprising. But so is the fact that I have a continuous infinity of copies. Not infinity, you don't need it. Okay, large number. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. Um, I think Jean had a follow up at some point. I don't know uh, if it still wants to ask. Uh, if so... After everybody. Sorry? I say after everybody else. No, no, just continue. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so I go to the next question, which was Valia. So, hi, Peter. Hi, Valia. Thank you for the talk. Hey. Um, so, I do have a question that has to do with um, your view. So, in if I understand correctly, you were saying something like um, quantum mechanics is just it's a it's not a fundamental theory. It is what it is. It um, it's totally empirically adequate and uh, um, we apply it to an ontology which is given. So my first question is given by what uh, in the sense that, you know, the fact that people started to talk about on, uh, particles had to do with the fact that they had a theory that could suggest what the ontology is. But um, my, I think the, the, the question that I want to ask more, which I'm more curious about uh, is, is this. So given that it's not a fundamental theory, it's not its job to provide us with an ontology, and um, this is the job or a more fundamental theory that will come. Okay, that's, is that, okay, good. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, no. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, let me just go ahead with the question and see mm -hmm. then. All right. So, um, um, part of the, um, of the reason why um, I was proposing that theory construction kit that you mentioned um, <clears throat> is that, um, we all, I mean, I would like to have such a fundamental theory that in the future will be uh, better compatible with relativity and stuff like that. That's exactly the reason why I wanted that. Um, um, and uh, so just, it seems to me that just to say, okay, quantum mechanics works, no relativistic quantum mechanics works. It reproduces all the, the, the data. Uh, that's great. But then how do you go from there to the next theory, to the one that's going to be compatible with relativity? So that's why I thought it was important to say, okay, look, right, you can have different possible ontologies, right, that you can use to construct the future theory, right? So, and then you pointed out, yeah, 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 but you're going to run into non-locality and this kind of business. Okay, uh, which of course, it's a problem, it's a challenge. Uh, and of course, I don't have a a set view about what's the best way to go then, but at least it's a start, right? Instead, it mm -hmm. seems to me that if you just say, look, right, it's just like empirically adequate and that's what it is. It's just like, okay, then what? What do we do now, you know? So how can you possibly come up with a new theory given that we have this one right there? Uh, either you start from scratch, which I don't think it's advisable because, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or, okay. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to, to mention is maybe connected to, I mean, it's surely connected to the last point that Lev made, namely, uh, you say, okay, let's try and see what happens if we try to violate independence, right? And I think that if you really want to, um, you know, uh, sell your view as a, a viable contender, I think that you really need to dig in exactly what the consequences are of that, right? Because it's not clear to me that, say, uh, you have an, a real advantage over there, right? So what are the consequences of violating independence over violating non-locality? Okay, okay good. sorry. Good, good. So, so I think I have 
three things. Right, so first question you said, right, so I say um, we apply quantum mechanics to a, an ontology taken as given. Given by what? Well, well, yeah, that's right, given by some previous theory. Um, so, you know, we have a theory that explains a lot of stuff in terms of particles moving around, but now here's some things it can't explain. It can't explain um, interference experiments, right? So um, what do we do? Well, we either say um, we were wrong about our ontology or we were wrong about our theory, right? And um, the suggestion is something like, um, if you look at the way quantum mechanics is used, I mean, this is, this is, this is something that, that Healy does at great length is like, you know, you go into a lab where they're shooting C60 molecules through a little grid and getting interference. Right. How are they thinking of what they're doing? They're applying quantum mechanics to um, C60 molecules, right? That's that's what they take to be their ontology, right? So um, given by what, given by the way that physicists are using their theory, it's something like that. Um, they're using it to describe the behavior of C60 molecules. Um, so their understanding quantum mechanics is, applies to, uh, is applied to those things, even though in a different application they might apply it to a field. So, um, so, so that was my that's my rough answer to that. Um, now, the bigger question um, regarding the theory construction kit. So, I think you're right that at the end of the paper, I'm circling back. You know, I say, ah, theory construction kit, so many moving parts, how am I ever going to decide, you know, which theory is better than which? That's, you know, and then at the end, you know, so I say maybe, maybe we could make do with a more thoroughgoing pragmatism. And, but at the end of the day, I'm not sure that I can really stomach Healy's thoroughgoing pragmatism. Right, where he says, we just got a classical ontology here. We could just got classical particles. Okay, so where are they when they're moving through the interference device? I don't describe the many properties. But then you haven't got a classical ontology, right? And so, so if that pragmatism is too pragmatic and not realist enough, then we come back, I guess, to something much more like your, your construction kit. And then, then you can see my proposal at the end is it's like, well, here's another another proposal for theory construction um, that at least looks like it might have an easier job fitting in with relativity. Um, now you're right that you know in order to um, show that this works, you're going to have to to look at its consequences, right? It's, 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 it's fine to just say, um, um, look, all the, all the causal paths are within light cones, right? So, so, so this, is a, this is a lot better. We've got, we've got no, um, we don't have to appeal to like holistic properties of the entangled pair or something like that, right? We've just got properties of particles and all the causal paths are within the light cones. So it, it at least starts off in the right direction um, but you're dead right. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to depend on what the theory looks like and what its consequences actually are. Right? Um, but yeah, point taken that, you know, I kind of dismiss this um, construction kit metaphor and then I come back to constructing something. <laughs> um, Davide, you're next. Uh, yes. Sorry for this light from the end. Uh, it seems like the Holy Spirit. I, I definitely need to look for another room. Uh, so yeah, I have to to one general consideration and, and one observation. The general consideration is I, I very much agree uh, that quantum theory in its standard form is not a good guide for ontology. Uh, I think this is uh, a point that I, I really take. Um, but <laughs> it, it seems to me that one one uh, 
thing to do is to uh, is to try to come around and arrive at the same empirical results in a different way. Otherwise, we are just stuck in the problem. Mm -hmm. So quantum mechanics is an extension of Hamiltonian mechanics, no mm -hmm. more and no less than that. We know in classical mechanics, we know that the Hamiltonian form of classical mechanics is a purely operational form. Then we have extended from dynamical variables to operator, and we come up with quantum theory, and we pretend that this form gives you an ontology. <laughs> is it, that's totally insane. That's totally insane. And we are here wondering what is the wave function, what is the an Hamiltonian operator, etc. Uh, now, in classical mechanics, this difference is very clear. So when I want an ontology, I come in Newtonian mechanics, uh, but again, expressing the Lagrange term and Hamiltonian and so on. I think that uh, we as philosophers, we may try to to come around the modern form of quantum mechanics, also you know, from philosophical or historical inside, whatever the means we can use. But I think this is the key, to not take in the standard mathematical form of quantum mechanics, to have another mathematical form with the same empirical uh, pre prediction. And this is, uh, it is possible to do. For example, the way I, I intend Bohm's theory is this one. So Bohm's theory in the original 1952, uh, what, what he really does is to write quantum mechanics as an extension of hamilton jacobi theory, and then as an extension of Newtonian, Newtonian theory. And I think Bohmian mechanics in the modern years have completely obscured this passage, that Bohm's mm -hmm. theory was a, a theory of potential and forces. Uh, and in this context, he tried to give a new theory a new physical theory and a new ontology. Uh, then, of course, there was the there is the problem of the wave function also in, in Bohm's theory uh, is relevant because I, I agree with uh, with what I would say. say physicists working on Bohm's theory has the impression that the quantum potential does something, that the wave function does something. Uh, but okay, my general consideration wants to be maybe we we should try to come up with another theory. Uh, from other methodological ground uh, and try to interpret from from that from that point. Uh, th this is, for example, what I tried to do with with my second version of the multi-field approach, because mm -hmm. the the first approach was in the wave function, but in in the second paper, I tried to connect the the multi-field not with wave function because I think the wave function is not an object, but with the phase and amplitude of the wave function. So, uh, you know, as a all complex function, uh, they usually in physics uh, uh, intend to be a coupling between real fields. So my, my idea was that the, the real multifield was the, the amplitude and the phase. And in this case, you have a very intuitive picture because from fields, you have potential and forces and these move the particle. But okay, <laughs> that was uh, a, a consideration uh, on the consideration, okay. Uh, the observation in, in, in studies on the um, uh, rotated bell. Mm -hmm. um, now, I was trying to figure out whether the rotated bell uh, and the space like uh, also with a global atemporal uh, ascription of property, if they are really physically equivalent. Because in the, in the rotated bell, uh, you have one state, then a measure, and a second state. So it, it is true that the second state depends on the first, but also depends on the measure. Uh -huh. If you if you have the, the normal bell, uh, you can may you can say okay, this is maybe equivalent to a, an ascription, uh, but it seems to me that more than a global, you have in any case a, a property coming from the state to the measurement and then another another time to, to the second state so yes it's uh, it's a kind of retrogasal explanation uh but also very peculiar because then you have time that go around uh, yeah i don't know whether you, you i don't know whether this is exactly what you had in mind yeah, exactly okay <laughs> okay yeah. Okay, yeah. so okay, I understood the second point. So uh, yeah, I leave I leave you with my my general consideration then on, on the ontology. 
Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. And th that's exactly the, the picture, you know, in, in, okay. in a rotated one, um, um, the, you can explain the later properties in terms of the earlier properties, right? Put it back so they're space like separated. So then it looks like you've got, you've got a, a causal influence backwards from each measurement back to the source. So you've got causal influences going this way. Like this. Okay, this like way, this. Right. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, that that's the, the violation of independence as Lev was was remarking is is you know it's it's a it's a big deal. It's not just a yeah not just a, a little matter of interpretation. It 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 changes our whole understanding of causation. So that's not to be taken See. up lightly, right? Okay. Um, thanks. So yeah, as far as um. Your observation goes. Um, the, I'm pushed in two directions, and I'm trying to tread a tightrope here that I'm not sure I'm treading successfully. So, on the one hand, you say, you know, what what the interpretation of quantum mechanics forces on us is is um, the need for new math and new physical theory, right? And that's what that's what Bohm's theory gives us, and that's what your a multi-field approach gives us, right? And and I, on the one hand, I you know I appreciate that, and that's what I've been thinking about for for most of my career. On the other hand, the the recent resurgence of of pragmatic approaches like Healy's sort of pushes me in the other direction. Like, well, we're trying to reinvent physics, and there's something kind of peculiar about that when it works so well, right? You know, like why why are we trying to Reinvent a theory that works great, right? Can't we just um, read our interpretation off the way it's used, and the way it's used is unproblematic. It, it, it's used to great effect, right? Um, so, on the one hand, I'd like to incorporate some of this pragmatic approach so that to whatever extent is possible, we don't have to reinvent physics from the ground up. On the other hand, as as you see, I kind of go back and forth, right? I'm not sure that it's possible. At the end of the day, Healy says, look, we just don't need to ascribe properties to these particles, you know, um, when yeah. they're when they're in the interference device. Um, and it seems to me that that's throwing away his assumption that we're just applying quantum mechanics to a pre-given ontology, namely classical particles. They're not classical particles, right? They're something else, but what are they, right? Maybe Healy would say, I don't have to say, we can use this theory fine. But then we're getting too close to instrumentalism for my take. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm, I'm right. stuck in this pendulum. Right. On the one hand, I don't want to reinvent <laughs> physics. On the other hand, right, I don't want to just be an instrumental, right? right? Is, there, is there a nice middle ground? Right, uh, right, right. I don't know. Right. Know. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Vera. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for your great talk. So I think that my question is related to Valia's question on Healy's um, idea that we should not think of the wave function of uh, quantum mechanics as uh, supplying a sort of ontology. So I feel a little bit puzzled by that and maybe I want to try to clarify what exactly this means. So if I um, take a quantum mechanics in a very naive and standard way, then it's a uh, kind of physical theory that aims to describe systems of certain scale. So we can say like atomic, subatomic scale. Uh, on the contrary, classical mechanics uh, targets another particular scale, the microscopic scale. Mm -hmm. um, so then, I mean, if uh, uh, one tells me, oh no, uh, actually quantum mechanics is not a theory about, I mean, does not tell you what the ontology is, then I feel a little bit, and it's the classical one, then I feel a little bit confused about the problem of scales. So like for me, it's like, okay, classical mechanics, uh, I don't know, like fluid mechanics tells you that, okay, fluids are continuous and, uh, you know, 
and you have this uh, continuity idea of fluid. But then, you know, at the micro scale, we know that no, we have um, some discreteness. Okay, so we have a discrete ontology. Okay, so normally I was uh, regarding, uh, you know, the contrast between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics in that way, you know, in terms of scale. But here is a proposal that maybe helped me conceptualize. So maybe I should understand uh, quantum mechanics in the same way I understand statistical mechanics. Mm -hmm. So I sort of kind of just a framework, like it gives you some kind of statistic, like in the case of statistical mechanics, it gives you some statistical tools to understand the assemblies of uh, microscopic uh, particles. Um, but then, I mean, still you, you yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe I just leave it to you if uh, my... Yeah, right. So how are we supposed to understand um, Healy's approach? I mean, uh, just... just um, the way Healy sees things, I think, I think he, he would say that the, the, the quantum classical um, divide is not a matter of scale, right? And he, he likes to talk about this C C60 interference experiment precisely because it makes that clear, right? So you've got these C60 molecules and they pass through the device and they interfere and then you, you deposit them on a, on a, on a plate and then you stick this plate under a, an electron microscope and you look at them one by one. You can, you can see them, right? So it's, you know, he, once they're on the plate, they're classical objects that we can image. When they're going through the interferometer, they're quantum objects subject to a wave function. But it's the same scale, right? So, I mean, I think Healy would say, no, it's not a matter of scale, right? But so then what exactly is it, is it a matter of? And, and I agree that it's, it's somewhat... Um, mysterious. Um, so Healy says, um, we apply quantum mechanics to an ontology taken as given, and, and you and Valia are quite rightly pressing on that question. Well, given, given how, right? Um, and I don't think that's a, a really a very easy question to answer, especially for Healy. I mean, Healy could say, well, at the end of the day, I'm going to image them in an electron microscope. So they're given, they're given by observation, right? Um, but that, that's when Healy starts to become too instrumentalist for my liking, right? And while no. we don't have to say anything about them while they're passing through the measure, measuring device, my my sort of gloss on Healy is um, to try and say. Well, we can posit an ontology, and this is where I'm, you know, getting close to Valia's position. We can we can posit an ontology and see if it'll do all the work we want it to do, right? And yeah. and the only way in which um, I'm close to Healy on this matter is. I don't. I'm not. I'm not all. I'm not convinced that we need to just pick one, right? That, that mm. we need to say quantum mechanics is about particles or quantum mechanics is about fields, precisely because it's not a fundamental theory. I mean, there there could be different models that are appropriate in different circumstances, and you know. So, is the world made of particles or fields? Um, that's a bad question at the quantum level. Maybe it's a good question at some level, but I don't. Wouldn't know how to go about answering it. Right. So, so we can we can posit an ontology at the quantum scale and see how well it works. And maybe we want to use two. Maybe we want to use several different ontologies at the quantum scale. And that I don't. I don't think that that in it, in itself would be problematic, given that quantum mechanics is not a fundamental theory. Thank you. Uh, Jean, you're up next. Yeah, I would like to make some general remarks about your interesting talk and defend a little bit the Breilbaum theory. Uh -huh. Because, you see, first of all, it's not true that all the three theories that you mentioned 
are empirically adequate. The GRW theory makes different predictions from quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. But of course, you adjust the parameters so to avoid being refuted by present day experiment. That's not exactly a nice move. So let's put that aside for a moment, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if you take of, of the many worlds theory, not following, of course, the interpretation that was given here, but if you take the theory as uh, done by uh, Valia, Lori, and others, then you have a continuous matter density, which was sort of goes back to Schrodinger's original idea of the wave function. But then, of course, if you have to solve that, you see, then it means atoms don't exist, molecules don't exist, they're just a blob of, and, and then, of course, on top of that, once you analyze the theory, it's not local as it should not be, it should not be non local, and it's not local. So it's not terribly attractive. And I think the correct reason, the correct lesson to draw from the coin duem thesis in philosophy of science is that you have to expect that God is malicious, but not uh, mischievous or not uh, mean, you see, because you can always invent theories that will be empirically adequate if you are willing to put enough, you know, enough, uh, accept enough uh, uh, wild ideas in your theory. Okay, I can believe that angels are uh, pushing the, the planets if I want. I can say any theory I want by making adjustment elsewhere in the system, as Quine says. So it seems to me that we look for a natural theory, and the breadbone theory is, as Shelley Goldstein puts it, the natural ontology, the obvious ontology evolving in the obvious way. Because you see, take the no go theorem, and take particularly the Cook and Specker type theorem, a better the similar theorem. Then it seemed to me that the natural interpretation is that particles don't have properties before they are measured. I mean, like spin values, polarization, et cetera. But then of course, if they, you say they have no property whatsoever, then indeed you have no ontology, not even a continuous matter ontology. Mm -hmm. Luckily in the broad boom, you get around it by having one ontology, which is the particle ontology, and maybe a field ontology for quantum field. Uh, let's put, okay, non, okay. And then, you see, then you have a particle ontology and that particle ontology accounts for the measurement and the no hidden variability, accounts for the context. Every measurement is contextual. And once you analyze the theory, you see why they are contextual, why the measuring device influences the particle, the setup, the measuring device influences the particle so that when you do a measurement, the breadbone theory, you never measure a property of the particle alone. So that takes care of the no hidden variable theory. Then of course, you have the problem of the perfect correlation at a distance which was the original worry of Einstein, Polosky, and Rosen. Since you don't have properties before measurement, it, it, it's very natural to say that those properties did not exist before measurement, and therefore that there was some action at a distance when you did the measurement. Therefore, the world is non-local. And so is Bohm's theory. So Bohm's theory is exactly non-local the way it should be, and it does not allow to send messages. So as mm -hmm. Detlef Dürer used to say, this is exactly what the doctor ordered. And, you know, uh, that's, so it's extreme. And the point is that the whole theory is so natural. You see, that it seems to me that it should not be put on the same level as, uh, you know, other theories with flash ontology or continuous matter ontology, et cetera. If you couldn't do, if you could not have a natural explanation with the obvious ontology of particles, then of course, I would understand why you would look for these far-fetched ontologies. But it seems to me that here, we have a very natural explanation. And about relativity, I still would like to know one prediction of relativity, which is not satisfied by the Brelbohm theory, maybe in field theory, which is of course a bit formal because field theory is always a bit formal, but all the predictions, as Bell says, you know, the michelson moll experiment will be predicted, et cetera. Whether you call the theory relativistic, that becomes a matter of terminology to some extent. So it seemed to me that, you know, the motivation for dropping the ontology on the one hand or for having these alternative ontologies, which are which physicists will never believe because physicists do things in terms of object located in space, even though they may deny it in their philosophical talk. Uh, it seems to me that uh, there is no motivation for that. Yeah, good. I, I think that's a very nice defense of, of, of Bohm's theory. Um, so there's one thing that seems to um, divide people. Um, physicists and philosophers alike, and that is um, whether you can, whether it's appropriate to pick out position as a preferred variable. I mean, and, and your response is, 
Sure, it's natural, right? Particles have positions. You're, you're muted. Can you turn your... Uh, no, the problem... No. Now you're still muted, but uh, the problem is not Zoom. Uh, oh, it's not... Yeah, I see this. There's yeah. No so can you can you check maybe on the settings or if you touched something on the on the oh. yeah, yeah like, you oh, there we go. okay yeah. i'm sorry i just i don't think you can choose any variable you want you see because you need to if you take only the the momenta for example what does it mean if there are no position i mean it's not so mm -hmm. simple to have an ontology made of anything else than position if you want to account for all the measurements right so i mean it's, alone, it's not a choice of a some basis, it's usually presented as a choice of basis. Right. But that's not the way to think about it. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there are, you know, there are arguments to be to be made um, for um, position being special um, in this sense. And you know, Bell was fond of making such arguments, and Bell was fond of Bohm's theory. So if you think that position is naturally picked out in some way, then, then Bohm's theory seems like the way to go. There are other people who, as you say, talk about. Well, this is choosing a preferred basis, and there's no, you know, it's violating some kind of symmetry in the in the in the math that you know you can. Um, so some people find this very unnatural to pick out position. Um, on the see, on the other I, hand, I see you located somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's precisely Bell's point that all our observations are observations of, of positions, right? So um, so you could certainly make an argument that position is 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 a natural place to start. As far as uh, GRW and um, matter density theories, right? Do they deny particles? Well, they do. It, well, so in a sense, right? I mean, that there is that particles are not fundamental, although the matter density can behave like a particle in in some circumstances, right? And uh, in particular. The matter density making up you will behave like a bunch of particles that are located where you are, right? So that's fine, right? So um, particle talk is safe, I think, for the most part, except when we're doing interference experiments. So th this is just to say that um, I agree, but that this talk of naturalness for Bohm's theory seems to be um, a matter of taste. There are some people who find it very unnatural, and I don't know what to say to, you know, to... Um, this is going back to, going back to my response to, to Valia's construction kit. You can construct a bunch of theories, and each of their proponents says, this is the natural way to understand the underlying physics, and I don't know how to adjudicate between competing claims of naturalness. Okay. Okay. Uh, you have a follow up, or I? No, no, that's okay. Ah, sorry, <laughs> I, I, I saw you thinking. So, uh, Alberto is next. Thanks. Now, first, I want to thank Peter for. A nice talk and also to take this view of comparing uh, so many different approaches uh, i think is the right uh, strategy to make a lot of uh, important points come out and i want to thank also the exchange between peter and lev i think is the first time i start to understand a little bit of the many words <laughs> <laughs> so it was very useful um uh, I would like just to point out uh, about the question, uh, why should we restructure physics? Why should we go so much uh, digging? Uh, it is true, uh, as the first level answer is Lev's answer, we shouldn't. It works for almost everything. But uh, there is a pragmatic uh, reason to do that, which is becoming more and more important today. And there are diff a diff there's different level of answer, and I just will give two examples here. One uh, is in quantum computing, uh, when you have to look for an algorithm, uh, 
which has a, a speed up that is uh, significant, uh, you don't know before you look for the quantum version of the classical algorithm if you're going to get a speed up or not, which means that uh, it's, it's like you're looking uh, for a needle in a big haystack uh, without a metal detector. <laughs> and you don't know if you're going to spend enough of time, effort, the good brains and money clearly around it, budget, uh, to get an algorithm that, yes, is a quantum version, but there's no speed up or is marginal. And so that's been one of the important motivation to dig deeper into the foundation of quantum mechanics. But there are others, and I would just want to give a second example, is that uh, is, is very well known uh, in 2012, the uh, uh, LHC machine in uh, uh, Geneva uh, did experiments at the level where they were expected to see supersymmetry particles. Uh, the, the machine was built for two reasons, uh, uh, from a justification of a multi-billion dollar budget uh, funded by everybody tax contribution. Uh, it was to confirm the standard model Higgs particle that uh, ticked uh, the box, so we, that is the past, and to detect uh, supersymmetrical particles, that's the future. These two motivations tick the box on the budget. The second one was missed. So there, there is again the same kind of issue that, uh, and you can, in high energy physics, the experiments are so expensive. You cannot just look for the needle in the haystack huh? because you're gonna finish the budget of all countries around the world very fast. Huh? And uh, uh, if you don't go deeper in the understanding of quantum mechanics, it's gonna be very difficult to manage uh, this kind of thing. So I, I encourage uh, to think about this uh, and uh, to continue to think about uh, comparing all these different uh, methodologies because each one will bring a part uh, of the answer. And thank you very much for the talk. Good, thank you for your comment. I, I yeah, I, I mean, I, I certainly, don't want to say that you know we should stop looking for new physics i mean obviously new physics is incredibly important in at least these two domains has incredible pragmatic importance um my worry is more i mean this is something that david wallace often says that um we we have a perfectly good theory, and this is you know something that Lev just said. We have a perfectly good theory um, for um, many applications of quantum mechanics. Maybe not for quantum computing. Maybe not for um, some of the experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. But um, for many contexts, quantum contexts, we have a perfectly good theory. So there doesn't seem to be any good motivation for redoing that bit of physics. I mean, maybe, you know, that there, that there are always the fringes and this is what, this is, this is the proper business of physicists. What, what, what David Wallace objects to, and I'm sort of echoing is, is philosophers dabbling in physics and, and making toy theories. So where no real new theory was called for. Um, so there does seem to be a difference between between those two projects. Thanks for the comment. Can I can I do a follow up? Uh, uh, I agree. What I was trying to say, nevertheless, is that the is not a new theory that is needed. But uh, if you don't have a better intuition, you miss the asset allocation, and is it has become too expensive for humankind. <laughs> at that level. And so yeah. there, is a, there is a pragmatic need, which is not uh, as small. And uh, the, the philosopher bring in a very valuable uh, tool, which is the, the gymnastic of comparing <laughs> so many different system of ideas, which uh, at the frontier of science is essential, but in established science is never done. So the scientific 
as scientists, we're less trained <laughs> to do it. Good. Yeah. yeah. I don't have a, a recipe. I just think there is a need. And, and this approach uh, is a part uh, of the search uh, for the answer. That's all. Good. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it reminds me of something that, that um, Lee Smolin is fond of, of saying that, you know, we, we, how are we going to hope to unify quantum mechanics and general relativity if we don't understand quantum mechanics, right? So, so you know, we, we need these, uh, a variety of conceptual points of view on quantum mechanics in the hope that one of them will lead to a conceptual breakthrough in that direction, right? So, so yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm in, entirely happy to say, think of quantum mechanics in, in a hundred different ways and see what's helpful. Thanks. Thank you. And I think uh, I have no further questions and it's getting pretty late. So I will uh, thank you again and resist from asking you anything. Thank you, Peter. Thanks a lot. Thank <laughs> Thanks again for inviting me, Christian. That was a that was a fun discussion. It was really good. And um, yeah, it was